Fear not, Scranton. This is Pastor Elliot Cook from Jackson Street Baptist Church, uh, here to remind you and encourage you in the Lord, that he loves you, that he cares for you. He has not abandoned you, not forsaken you. He still loves you. Hey, you're a Christian. At least I'm praying you are. If you're not, trust in Jesus. He died on the cross for your sins, people. Uh, it's the easiest way to uh, make sure that you have a home in heaven and glory. Hey, let's get right to it. Today is something special for you from God's word in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 25 to 31 is where I'd like to take you today. Now about virgins. Who said the Bible's boring? All right, we're getting to the virgins. All right. Um, I have no command from the Lord, but I have a judgment as one by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Now, I thought this was all part of God's inerrant word of God. Why is he saying it's not from God, uh, that it's him and he's endorsed by, by Jesus? So is this supposed to be authoritative or not? It's authoritative. People, it's in God's word, it's authoritative. He was writing not under inspiration, um, overtly, that he, uh, there were plenty of times when he was writing under the compulsion of the spirit. He knew that God was asking him to write this way. Here, he's writing and being inspired, but it's not overt. He doesn't understand that this is definitely from God, but it was. Uh, that's why it makes it here in God's holy word. It's why it was in the letter in the first place. God was inspiring the whole thing, but he thinks he's got humility about himself and his opinions and his ideas. Little did he know it was inspired from God. Um, I have no command from the Lord about virgins, but I, as one who has judgment and is trustworthy, verse 26, because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Uh, we talked about that previously yesterday about uh, remaining as you are when you come to the Lord. Here in this context, he's talking about your marital status, your having relations, um, pursuing marriage. Uh, it's better for you to remain single, he's saying here in this passage, because of a present crisis. What in the world is going on in Corinth in 60 AD that he's encouraging people not to get married? Interesting. Interesting times. There were persecutions. If you were a Christian, uh, you could be stoned, killed, strung up, you know, crucified. And if you had a wife and children, they would be orphaned. They would be on their own. She would be a widow with a family to care for. And in those days, there was no welfare. There was no social worker coming to knock on the door to help you get through, especially if your wife and children were Christian. It's better that you not marry during this present crisis. Now that crisis is over, at least for us here in the United States of America. We're blessed with freedom, religious liberties, so on and so forth. There are still places in the world where it is all too uh, appropriate to adopt this verse and to understand that maybe in in regions where where there are militant uh, extremist groups who swoop into the village and take all the Christians and kill all the Christians, um, maybe it's best not to marry in that situation. I mean, it's, it's going on today. It's just not going on here in Scranton, at least not yet. I pray it never does. Um, but what's going on in the world is comparable to what's going on in Corinth at the time Paul is writing this. It is good for a man to remain as he is. Verse 27, are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Whatever state, if you were engaged to a woman and, and you got saved, you became a Christian, you ought to continue to court that woman and to consider um, the marriage proposal that you made. You shouldn't look just because you became a Christian to be released from that pledge, okay? You'd be a person of your word, but have serious conversations about matters of faith that have changed since you proposed. But it's not a reason 
to walk away from that covenant relationship. Pastor, you know, you said earlier that, that uh, you know, Christians and non-Christians should have nothing to do. We shouldn't date. So if I'm engaged, shouldn't I break off the engagement? Well, don't be so fast to do so, is I suppose what I'm telling you. Um, you know, if you're pledged to a woman, do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? You're not engaged. You're not married. Married. Do not look for a wife. In these present times, in this present persecution that you're going through, Again, we don't necessarily relate to this. I'm trying to explain it to you. So when you read a passage like this, it wasn't necessarily written for you in Scranton in 2020. Okay? It is appropriate for other places around the world, North Africa, where marauders come in and, and rape, pillage, destroy, uh, burn down churches and so on and so forth and, and impress the children into their army, servitude. Um, making the, the wives sex slaves. I mean, there's some terrible things happen going on in the name of religion, not in the name of Christianity, by the way. Christianity um, is a peaceful religion. But here, here you see all sorts of um, recommendations, you know, because of the state that we're in, because of the persecution that you're going through, it's best to remain as you are, and to seriously consider if you want to um, seek a wife. Uh, verse 28, But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. You know, marriage isn't wrong. It's, it's God's way. It's, it's a blessing. It's, it's good. It's appropriate. It's right. But in a present crisis where there's tremendous persecution, you've got to think long and hard before you put yourself and others through all that. Um, but those who marry will face many uh, troubles in this life, he goes on to say. And I want to spare you this, the troubles of the present time of Corinth and North Africa today, not marriage. <laughs> marriage is not a trouble. It's a blessing. It may seem like trouble. Sometimes it's not. It's a blessing. And uh, today in Scranton, unless you're I don't know, a special circumstance or situation, I, if you're so inclined, I would encourage you to get married rather than to burn in lust after other people or to commit fornication. You know, that's my counsel to you today. It's a very different time. Um, verse uh, 29. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not, and those who mourn as if they did not, and those who are happy as if they were not, and those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, and those who use things of this world as if not engrossed by them. For this world and its present form is passing away. The world is going to hell in Corinth in 60 AD, okay? Tremendous persecution. There's trouble everywhere. It's not easy to navigate. And you shouldn't take anything for granted. And you ought to be very, very careful what you commit to and what you're um, getting involved in. Because this world is going to disappear. I mean, it's, it's temporary. It's passing. Why is it passing? Here we are 2,000 years later. It didn't pass. Why did he give this advice to the Corinthians? Why did he tell them that this world was passing? Well, in a sense it was because they would be martyred for their faith. And they would be taken from the world. And the world would be passing from them. And all that they're trying to grab with their hands and hold on to will slip right through their fingers. You can't take it with you. You can't build an empire and continue to reign and rule after your death. There's only one who reigns forever, and it's not you. It's the Lord God. This, this passage is just reminding us of the temporary nature of life and our commitments. 
And we have to be so careful, especially in times of persecution. I got to remind you that this passage is talking about uh, perhaps not pursuing marriage during this struggle, this time of intense persecution where, you, you know, a lot of people are dying and you could die as well. So be careful, not live life to the fullest, but be careful and, and act as though you don't own anything if you own stuff. And if you are married, act as if you're not. And if you, that's not, understand what that means. Um, when he says, those of you who are married as if you were not, uh, he's not saying to neglect your wife and, and your spousal duties and don't support your, your, but understand that this marriage relationship that you have currently is passing, it's transitory, it's not going to last in the midst of persecution. Your wife's going to be dragged off. You know, she's going to be serving in a harem somewhere and you yourself might be strung up on a cross next week. The seriousness of it all. Hard, hard times that the Christians endured. And Paul gives them the advice to, you know, remove yourself from the world because you're going to be removed from the world anyway. So if you're happy, don't get too happy. And if you're mourning, well, as if you weren't mourning because you're going to see them soon in glory. And we, we have no comprehension. Your neighbor gets dragged out into the street and shot. We have no comprehension of what that's like. Our children being pressed into service. And the next time we see them, they have guns. And they're going from house to house. Our children. We have no idea what that's like because it hasn't happened here in America. But there are places in the world today where this scripture means an awful lot to them. You ought to understand God's word. It's, it's filled with all sorts of cool stuff. Stuff that you want to learn, you want to grow, you want to be mature, you want to have an answer for those people in North Africa. Somebody's fleeing uh, the terrorism and they come here to the States and they move into you next door. You're having a Bible study with them. You ought to know how they're thinking. And you ought to be able to interpret the word of God to them uh, properly so that they can understand it. That's what mature Christians do. They study the word of God. They know it and uh, work at it. It takes a lifetime and beyond. Uh, some of the greatest Bible scholars will admit to you they don't have a good handle on it yet. They've only read it 300 times from cover to cover. Seriously. <laughs> Every time I read it, it means something different. I pray that God will inform your heart and mind. Every time you read the Bible, pray. God, speak to me through your word. Help me to understand it and make it come alive. Transform my heart and my mind, my life. Help me to live it. I love you for all that you've done for me, for all that you are, for all that you've done. I worship you and praise you. Help me, Father, to navigate this world and to make it into the next, into your presence for all eternity. I so look forward to that. Thank you for Jesus and his death on the cross. Thank you for all that I have and enjoy and the freedoms that I take for granted. I am so sorry. I do pray for my brothers and sisters halfway around the world who are enduring tremendous persecutions. And I confess that I don't pray for them enough. Help me, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help my brothers more. Please, Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Prayer. Get used to it. It's just talking to God. It's letting your heart flow. Uh, I, I don't know. You just start doing it. You know, didn't know that you could be a father or a mother. How, how do you raise a child? You just do it because you love him so much. Same thing with prayer. You just do it because you love him so much. Hey, Scranton, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Remember, fear not, Scranton. I'll see you tomorrow. Pastor Ellie Cook signing off from Jackson Street Baptist Church.